Let's pray now, and we'll transition into our, our text and our sermon time. And Father, as we open up God's word, your word, we know that it is powerful. As, as Peter said to you, Jesus, you have the words of eternal life. Where else can we go? Your words are meaningful, they are impactful, and they, they, they go right to our heart, cut us in the heart sometimes. And God, a passage like this can do that. It can make us feel convicted and, and feel guilty, and, but, but God, we know that you provide so much grace. And so as we come this morning, help this text to apply and to change our lives. We pray this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Well, our sermon this morning comes from Romans chapter 14. You're welcome to take a, a Bible or your phones out and turn to there. We've been walking through the book of Romans this, this whole year. And the last part of Romans gets very, very practical. Love one another. Serve one another. Be hospitable toward each other. It's about each other. It's about our relationships together on a Sunday morning, uh, on Monday, on Tuesday, I mean, all throughout the week. The church body, all of you, it's about your relationships here at Lighthouse. That's why we've called this whole series One Anothering, how we do relationships together. And in chapter 14, in Romans, we come to a, uh, a difficult issue that the church, the people in Rome are, are having, this is 2,000 years ago, uh, they were judging each other. They were being unwelcoming to certain groups. Uh, they had poor attitudes. They're being hypocritical towards some groups. They were judgmental Christians judging Christians. That's what I've called our sermon this morning, these Christians are being judgy. Unfortunately, we still have this problem 2,000 years later. Sometimes, occasionally, uh, often, uh, we can judge each other. Or we judge those outside the church, so much so that it's kind of what Christians are known for sometimes. I found this article uh, by Kerry Newhoff. He says, um, Jesus said Christians should be known for how deeply we love, yet studies show that in the eyes of many non-Christians, we're known for how deeply we judge, not for how deeply we love. The problem in many cases is not that unchurched people don't know any Christians. The problem is that they do, and they don't like us for good reason. Or you can think of the popular phrase like, don't judge me. What right do you have to condemn me and, and my actions or what I do behind closed doors? Or for you to think that you're better than me somehow. There's a pastor that I know that um, we've got some similar uh, beliefs and likes, um, but every time I, I talk to them, they're always telling me about um, and their church and, and how they are disciplining people out of their church. Every time I talk to them. And there's, there's some things we need to do as Christians, as a believers, to say that you know sin is wrong, we need to disciple somebody, but to be a church that always kicks people out is that is that welcoming or or we're called hypocrites we say one thing and do the opposite this article i mentioned by by carrie newhoff it was called five ways judgmental christians are killing your church he says that judgmental christians they they lack love right they're usually not the ones that are helping in the ministries of your church. They lack humility, they don't pray, and they really hinder evangelism. So what do we do? I mean, I would guess that if I took a poll in here that many of you, many of us, would say that we've been judged wrongly at some point. Maybe even by a Christian. 
or a church? How do we balance love and, and talking about sin? How do we balance holding people accountable for, for sinful things, uh, for blatant sins in their life, but not judging them? Well, their text says it starts with us. It starts with those inside this building, the church. We're called to stop judging each other. So let's turn to Romans 14 and see how Paul unpacks this. Number one, welcome each other and stop arguing about opinions. Chapter 14, verse 1. As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. So Paul kind of warms up his, his, uh, his recipients of this letter. He, he warms us up to this topic of, of judging and judgmentalism with kind of a, a positive and, and a negative, right? Uh, positive, you should be welcoming, first off, um, but you should... Uh, this negative, stop doing this, uh, stop kind of arguing uh, just about uh, opinionated matters. So number one in here is to welcome each other. We should be a church, we should be a body of believers that welcomes different people. Later on in chapter 15, verse 7, Paul's going to say this about God. Therefore, welcome one another because Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. Because Jesus has welcomed you into his family, we should welcome each other. Another article I found was called, Why Are Christians So Judgmental? Michael Hidalgo shares this story. He says, just last week, I spoke with a young woman who had not been to church in over 10 years. Her reason was simple. She felt condemned. When she was younger, she made a mistake. The attitude and words of those in her church told her she was not welcome, so she left. To this day, she carries the wounds given to her by others. My conversation last week with that young woman concluded with her telling me why she came back to church after a decade. She met someone who loved her. When she told her story, she was met with tears, not punishment. When she spoke of her wounds, she, was an, she saw an agonized face looking back at her. When she encountered love, it met her in a place far deeper than her wounds could ever go. And because of that, she's on a path of reconciliation. It's been a new you know, phrase for the last oh, 10 or plus years of church hurt. That we often hurt each other or a Christian is hurt by the church in some ways. One of the ways we try to live out that verse of that earlier, Romans 15, 7, to welcome each other as Christ has welcomed you is with our hospitality team. Many of you are a part of that. If you don't know, you know that whole team that kind of greets you when you come in in the morning or our kids check in or the kitchen is kind of called our hospitality team because we want to have friendly faces. Today we have like kids' faces <laughs> welcoming you this morning to church, Right? That should be part of what it means to be a Christian, to feel welcome and not, he says, not to argue about opinions. Just stop that. He says, stop quarreling and arguing over your opinions. I, I think it's okay to have opinions, but it's kind of the, the arguing about them that leads to the problem, right? I have my opinions about music, right? I, I like a song that's got like a good banjo or mandolin, um, but, but, but I don't like country music. It's not really music. Uh, like I even like jazz. I'm a bassist, so like give me all the bass you can get in a song. I think chocolate peanut butter ice cream is really the only kind of ice cream you need. I think that the NFL is better than college football. I think the Bears are the best, right? I think action movies, sci-fi movies, anything with kind of a good twist is the only kind of movie you should watch. Drama movies, what's the point of that, right? I mean, we all have opinions we can argue about and talk about. Like, that's, that's okay. 
would I feel welcome in your house if I had a different opinion than you, say on politics, uh, religion, or football? I think it's okay to have different opinions, but it's, it's the arguing, the being insistent on I am right nature of how we talk about those things as Christians that can cause us to be unwelcoming. Let's read on and see how he then goes into this judging stuff. Verse 2, one person believes he may eat anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains. And let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before your own master that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld. The Lord is able to make him stand. So number two, Christians, Lighthouse, watch your attitude and judgmental thoughts. I tried this morning to kind of be a good, good pastor. I got all W's for my, my letters today. So welcome each other. Watch your attitude. But notice this other W word that's kind of popped up in verse 1 and 2. He talks about uh, somebody who is weak in faith or the, the weak person. Or you're going to call them a a brother, a, the weaker brother. What does he mean? What, what is he talking about by this weak in faith person? I don't think he means weaker in faith like they are not a Christian. He's not saying these weak people are unbelievers. Instead, these are Christians, I think, but they're maybe newer Christians. Maybe they don't have an assurance of what they believe or that they're going to heaven quite, um, or they just don't quite know how to act from their previous life to now as a Christian. Maybe they're still bringing some old practices, maybe from a Jewish faith or their pagan faith, into their life as a, a Christian. And the problem seems to be here in verse 2 to 4 is food. There appears to be different Christians here, the different opinions on food you can eat and food you cannot eat. So likely there's some Jewish Christians uh, who had rules and laws from the Old Testament that said what you could and could not eat. Um, Different backgrounds. One says you can eat anything. One says you can eat only vegetables. Now, Paul, uh, in his own life as a Jew coming a Christian, he wrestled with this. He wrestled with Peter with this, and and what can we do, what can't we do? And and Paul came to understand for all of us that we can eat all things now. There's not this kind of rule or law over us, and so that's why he kind of calls them a, a weak person, as he says, the one who eats only vegetables. I mean, of course they're weak, right? They only eat vegetables, right? I mean, if they would eat like the, the magical animal of a pig like that makes ham and pork and bacon, I mean, they would know, right? I'm, I'm joking, right, a little bit. Like, I'm not just saying that like vegetarians are, are weak, but he's saying here that there's different kinds of Christians and some do this, some do that. Um, if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 8, he's also talking to them about former pagans that became Christians that sacrificed um, food to idols. And should you eat that food or not eat that food? He uses the same phrase of uh, the the weak and that we should not be a stumbling block to them. But he tells us that we should check our attitude and our judgment toward these people. He says uh, you shouldn't despise somebody else. And you shouldn't judge somebody else, whether they're eating or or not eating. It it depends on your attitude, your heart, kind of what's going on on the inside. 
Now, I think he's, he's talking about more practice issues than maybe theological issues here. How do you practice your faith as a Christian? But when we judge somebody, um, maybe we are condemning them, um, condemning them to hell even. Maybe there's some form of gossip that's going on and we talk about somebody else. Oh, we love, we love doing this as, as, as a people, as Americans, I think. When some celebrity has some sort of, you know, falling or divorce, we, we want to know all the juicy details, right? So we can, uh, I don't know, think we're, we're better than them. Or I was really uh, just sad in this last week. I heard about a, a church that I used to be a part of that is just kind of, uh, it's struggling. It's had a number of pastors who have stepped down recently. And there's part of me that's like, I want to know all the juicy details of what's going on there. And I've had to like check myself, like, do I want to know that for a good or a bad purpose? Am I, do I just, I want to know that I'm better than them or judging them, or is it to pray and to help? <laughs> judging, I think, is, is you're, you're characterizing a person and instead of helping them. And this is the balance we're called to as Christians, that we're not called to judge each other, but we're called to help each other, to keep each other accountable. When we see somebody who is sinning, they're, they're having an affair, they're getting drunk all the time, you, you fill in the blank. We are called to help, to keep accountable. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. This is the other balance of that. He uses the same word judge, but it, look what he says. Um, For what have I to do with judging outsiders, people outside the church, non-Christians? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside. What he's saying is that we need to keep each other accountable to sin and that we should watch our hearts and attitudes and how we talk to each other. And he does even in these verses too. He just, he points to God. He brings God into the picture. God has welcomed all, even, you know, who are you to, to judge God's servant? God will make them stand. He will uphold them. And then he goes on in verses five to nine to kind of change the perspective, looking at the one that is being judged. So number three, whatever you decide to do, do it to God. Whatever you decide to do, do it to God. Verse five, one person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord. Since he gives thanks to God, while the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives to himself and none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord. If we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. This time, it's a problem of days or holidays. You know, one person thinks one day is more important, is special than other. Uh, One person sees them all as the same. It reminds me of what Paul says in Colossians chapter 2, verse 16 and on. He says, Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink, or with regard to a festival, or a new moon, or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions, puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind, and not holding fast to the the head from whom the whole body nourished and 
knit together through its joints and ligaments grows the growth that is from God. He says, don't anyone judge you or disqualify you by food or festivals or new moons or Sabbaths. Yeah, there could be some disagreements going on in Rome with these Christians about how you do the Sabbath or um, this new moon pagan festival. What do we do with it? So Paul, he turned the perspective around back to the person who is then being judged. Someone who's being judged by another person. And he says that each of us should be, verse 5, fully convinced in your own mind. If you believe as a Christian that you should do this, then do it. Be fully convinced of it. Look into Scripture. Understand it, why that is. If you believe you should do something different, then, again, go to Scripture. Figure it out. Put it into practice. Do it. There's this phrase, though, that we often use in um, our our denomination, the Evangelical Free Church of America. And it says, in essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. and Everything else, charity. And so, there may be some things that we disagree on as Christians. You know, um, I might have some opinions in uh, theological opinions that you disagree on, but we as Christians are going to agree on these are the essential. This is Jesus is Lord and Savior. He is God. He was real. He died, rose again. The Bible is the inspired, totally true word from it. There's, there are things that we can say, these are the essentials of the faith. And there are other practices, maybe theological things that we might disagree on. Let me give you an example. Uh, this last year, when we took a group to Uganda, uh, toward the end of our trip, we were um, at the source of the Nile. And we were all kind of thirsty, and so we were walking around, and, and we decided to buy some drinks there. And I just asked uh, Pastor Julius, I said, Julius, what would happen if somebody from your church uh, had a beer, you know, drank, drank alcohol? And he said, oh, they would not be a Christian. And I said, what, what do you mean? And he said, no, they, they would not do that. They would not drink any alcohol. And I said, well, I'll just indulge me. Like, say you found out somebody was drinking alcohol in your church, just, you know, one beer. What would you do? And he said, I would take them aside, and I would tell them they cannot do that. You know, they would go through many classes on discipleship. That is a different opinion on how you deal with alcohol than maybe you have. Maybe you have different opinions on uh, sports, fashion, music, movies. Which, which Bible translation to use? Uh, there, there used to be, you know, uh, dancing, uh, playing cards, um, tobacco, all of these things we can disagree on. And it's okay to have opinions, but maybe it's the arguing and the arguing over non-essential things, the practice things that don't matter. He says, for you, for me, we are to be doing everything we can as to the Lord. I've got my scripture journal up here, and I just kind of circled all the times in this little passage, you know, honor of the Lord. Verse 6, thanks to God. Honor of the Lord. At the end, thanks to God. I mean, Verse 8, to the Lord, to the Lord, you are the Lord. I mean, everything you do, whether you live, whether you die, this is what Christ did from his dying and living, he did to the Lord. So whatever you do, your work, your home, it is to be to the Lord. Finally, number four, we will all stand before God's judgment. Verse 10, why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or you, why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then, 
each of us will give an account of himself to God. We will all stand before God's judgment. It's not our job to judge each other. It's not our job to judge people in the world, celebrities or whoever. James chapter 4, verse 12, there's only one lawgiver and judge. He who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your, your neighbor? Now, he is not saying here that when he says every knee will bow, every tongue confess, that there's going to be some sort of universalism that everybody's going to come and just acknowledge that at the end times or when you get to heaven, like, oh, everybody gets to come and believe in God. What he's saying is, no matter if you believe or not, when you get up to heaven, when you, when you die, when you get to face God face to face, you will know that there is a God. You will bow to him. Whether you bow as one who is bowing in worship or bow as one who's just obeying. Because this is really a scary section here that talks about that God is the one to judge us. He's the one that we have to give an account to. If you think of all of your life, all of your thoughts, all of your day-to-day good bad temptations. Each of us will give an account of himself to God. And the scary thing about that is that none of us are good enough, right enough, can say enough to convince God of anything. But it's only by that verse earlier that I read, chapter 15, verse 7, Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you. That is the amazing thing. That when we think about standing before the judgment seat of God, Christ is the one that welcomes us. And so for a church, for the people of God that may struggle with being hypocritical or judgmental or over opinion, what, what is the solution? What is the answer? I think it's welcoming or loving. And so let's practice those things as a church. Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful that you have welcomed us. You have made a way through Jesus Christ that though our sins are, are scarlet and many. You have thrown them into the sea. You have destroyed them. And so when we stand to give an account, God, you, you just, you judge what Jesus has done. And so God, as we think about each other here, those that are very different from us, maybe skin color or gender or just political leaning, Lord, Help us to have a welcoming, Christ-like, loving attitude to love each other, to pray for each other, to be hospitable toward each other. Father, we give you all the glory. We pray for the grace to make that happen. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.